Bases dropped on a beautiful Tuesday morning here in Metro Atlanta. It's June 11th. It's soccer down here live for a Tuesday, Tuesday Thoughts edition of the show. Use that hashtag, tweet at us at soccer down here if you want to join into the conversation. We've got the U.S. women's national team kicking off the World Cup at 3 o'clock this afternoon. We have Atlanta United kicking off their Lamar Hunt U.S. Open Cup run for 2019 this evening at 7.30 from Charleston, South Carolina. All kinds of things to get into this morning about both of those matches and everything else going on in the soccer world. But first, a moment of zen from John. Well, I don't know if it's a moment of zen. Uh, and By the way, New Zealand and the Netherlands are, are going on right this very second. But with the uh you know the, this being the time of year where folks will venture outdoors to cook you know we we have those rather oh, large no, things you didn't try on. to cook a steak did you no it was chicken oh boy but uh because of uh what the boss is doing and we're having a, a get together with her crew this weekend and so she wanted to see if the grill, if there was enough uh, gas still in the in the tank for it to work and things like that. So she wanted to grill a couple of uh, she wanted to grill a couple of uh, chicken slabs yesterday. Chicken so slabs? go out there, put what kind well, of chicken slabs were they? <laughs> uh, they were pretty tasty. I mean, they were marinated in Dales for about a half an hour, so they, they well, functioned no, well. No, no, I'm asking what part of the chicken was it? Was it chicken I'm breast? Was it, it chicken thighs? Was it white no, meat, it was dark breasts. meat? It, okay. bo- boneless, boneless breast. There we go. That's what I was looking for. Slabs doesn't yeah. really sound appealing. No, no, they were, but they were large and slabs. <laughs> so, all right. So, you know, I put them on the grill yesterday. And obviously by the fact that I'm talking to you, that I did in fact survive the, <laughs> the cooking of said chicken slabs. Did something not survive? But I don't know. I mean, the boss is okay and I'm okay. So we're one for one this year. But, you know, to start a, a grill, when you turn the gas on, you usually have to take a, a match and put it in a side port. And then, you know, when you've got it all started, then the match goes in and it, it uh, <laughs> catches on fire and then all is good. So I just I want to know if anyone out there who has a grill has ever singed their hair. <laughs> Oh, no. Because I'm fairly certain I did that yesterday. Oh, no. <laughs> um, yeah, if anybody wants to chime in on this one, please do. Because I, I can't wait to see the tweets about this. Oh, my gosh. Well, yeah, because you know when you when you put the the match in the side port with the you know with it being done, and then you get the big, <laughs> and you know you get that big flash of flame and everything. Yeah, you, I don't you think that don't my my head was of flame. First off, that, but you don't have any good. choice because you have to go in the side well... port with it, and we um, didn't have a match, so I used the the gun. You know, we have the the gun <laughs> oh, here at the house. Goodness. So, you know, I put the gun in the, the side port, and the second that it came within, like, five inches of the side port, then you get the big... <laughs> and if the HOA I is I... listening, you're going to be banned from grilling. So, you know, I put it in, it worked, and we grilled, and the only thing I think that might have caught on fire were a couple of my hairs on my head. I just want to know if I'm the only one who's ever done that before. Um... 
that's that's all kinds of wrong things to do with your grilling techniques and it, it's yeah you you probably just shouldn't grill you, you should probably hire somebody that, that's that's where i'm at with it you want to come over and grill um boy, i want to see this grill first off because it doesn't sound like it's it's in the greatest of shape if if that's what you're having to do to light the thing um but yeah, you might need to hire somebody because otherwise Daniel uh, Price admits, you might burn the place yes, down. burned and singed my hair and even my nose hairs. It's a terrible smell, burnt hair all day. Bur- no, it's no, a terrible no, no. smell, there, burnt hair all day. There's a couple different things here. It, have people who have grilled, have they done something like this? Yes. Yes, absolutely. But That's my question. No, there's there's things that you have really made worse. So, you need to be a little more careful with the grilling first off. Because it sounds like you might need some remedial classes. You might Grilling need for dummies? Classes. Yeah, th- there's probably a book. There might be a YouTube video. Maybe I should just make the book? Yes, that would also be true. Um, or how but, not to? Yes. Yes. Um, lots of how not to's. See, I could I could be a gazillionaire if I wrote all the how not to books. Yeah, well, hey, that's a that's that's a thing that could work. But I just thought I'd put that out there. I didn't know if I was the only one. It's been a long time since I I singed hair trying to grill. Um, I know I've done it. I I can't remember the circumstances, but I know I've done it. I think it was generally like. Like on my arm or something. It was never on my head. That's uh No, this was my head. Yeah, that's a big problem. Um Yeah, it was generally on my arm or something, but one, I'm not a I, I'd much rather go charcoal if I can uh, on the grill. I'm I'm definitely partial to the, the charcoal. Yeah, we got a gas grill. Yeah, you need to figure out how to adjust how much gas is coming through when you stick the the lighter gun, as you called it, when you stick that in there. Because I don't know what probably, else to call the thing. You probably want to uh, turn that gas down a bit instead of having the giant flame. You don't have any choice. You're supposed to set head. it to the lightning bolt. Well, normally, and I don't know, what, again, what kind of grill you have. Normally, you're not having to stick a match in anywhere. You have a like a, a starter thing on your grill yeah you can do that but they say like if the starter because this is an older grill and so if the Uh, starter doesn't function then you've got to do you have the option of doing the match through the side port See, here's the thing is if you turn the gas all the way up with a starter function cool if you turn the gas all the way up where you're sticking things in side ports and leaning over it probably not you probably want to turn that down over it. I was, I was, I wasn't even leaning over. Yeah, there's, there's a lot of things that went wrong with that, and it's just a good thing that um, you did not become Fire Marshal Bill or anything like that. Uh, that's, that's good. Yeah, you might need some videos. Uh, Mike, Michael Head says three words: big green egg. Get one. Almost impossible to singe yourself. That's true. That, that's true. Um, I have not had one, but yes, that. From what I know of the big green egg, you would be, well, let me rephrase. Uh, most people would not have the problem of burning themselves. Yeah, you know, I'm trying to trying to cover all my bases. Um, most people would be okay with the big green egg. And the big green egg is good. It, it's a whole different kind of style of stuff. But yes, it is excellent when you have the big green egg around. No, I just thought I would put that out there and see if I was if I was alone on an island or not. Yeah, we need to find you a better way to light that thing because that's that's not good. When there's flame going up that high and you're not leaning over something and you're burning your head or burning your hair on your head, yeah, that's a that's a narrow miss from being much worse. So let's uh let, let, let's figure out a way to be a little more careful. How about that? Yeah, the 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 boss uh, was quite. Yeah, she was she was laughing over that one too. Oh well, yeah. I mean, once once you know your your head's not on fire, then yes, there's plenty of things to laugh about in that. I mean, did it stink? Did your hair stink? Because that's the worst smell. Singed hair is just. Horrible. I don't I don't think it stunk, but but you could tell that there was something different in the texture. <laughs> you had burnt ends on your hair. Oh uh-huh. man. Um. 
All right. Well, if anybody wants to to help John out with grilling safety measures, uh, please point him in the right direction. Other than the word don't. Yeah, there's that. Um, and figuring out which part of the chicken you're cooking and not calling it a slab. That That's another it's thing. A, it's a bre- it was two rather large breasts. Ooh, off the crossbar. That would have been New Zealand against the Netherlands in the uh, Women's World Cup match this morning. Yeah, New Zealand so, off the crossbar in the well, 11th minute. We are not doing play-by-play of this because we don't want to run afoul of, of any of our friends over at the Fox Networks. So we no, will, although uh, we have you... had our first Tom Sermani chewing gum cutaway. Yes, we will keep you up to date on what's going on in the match. Um, the U.S. women kick off at 3 o'clock today. And if you did not hear our World Cup date from last night, and if you did not just see the tweet that I retweeted, uh, our friends Kelly and Jessica will be over at the Midway Pub in East Atlanta for a USWNT World Cup watch party. And they're going to record Queens of the South after that. Also going to uh, record a cup date with us after the game as well. So get their immediate thoughts about how the U.S. look today. It's a, uh, it, it's kind of an interesting one because you're playing Thailand. You're, you're playing the weakest team in the group, I think. I think Chile is a, a possibility to sneak through as a third place. I think Thailand's the weakest team in the group. But you're kind of in a no-win situation here because if for some reason you don't win, it's, it's panic button time. If you win 2-0, 3-0 comfortably, ah, well, that's to be expected. That's not good enough. And if you win bigger, then it's like, ah, oh, well, you're, you're playing a weak team, so it doesn't matter. What defines success for you for the U.S. today against Thailand? Mm, yeah, see, then that's the thing is that being in this no-win situation. Uh, to give you an idea as to what some other folks were thinking, there's a, a contest involving a network where you try to come up with as many wins in a row and you get money. The number that they have put out there is six or more. Okay. Yeah, we don't have a, we don't have a competing sponsorship, so you can say that's ESPN. Okay. Well, uh, ESPN.com's streak for the cash right now. They they have uh, U.S. winning by six or more or any other result. And it's tough for me. I don't think it's you know I don't know if they're gonna if they're gonna win by more than six I just don't but for me success obviously I, you know I, I'd like to see a comfortable win I'd like to see relationships I'd like to see little societies I'd like to but the thing is is that with this you don't I don't know how you can gauge you know the the issues that we all have thought that the U.S. was going to have coming into the tournament because you're you know if it's if you win big then are you putting lipstick on on the proverbial pig by just sitting there saying okay yeah well we won like eight one or, or seven nothing or something like that I don't think you get a good gauge until match day three uh, as to where you stand when it comes to philosophies and, and approach and attack and all this kind of stuff. I think that you get the opportunity to grow into the tournament. So if I just said a solid first step, whatever that entails, you know, everybody gets in healthy, gets out healthy, you win comfortably. And I, you know, honestly, when you ask me that, I'm just kind of like, eh. I don't have a solid answer for you because the anticipation is that it's going to be a comfortable win with the word comfortable in quotes. I mean, I think you're you're at a point where you're not defining it by the final score. You yeah. can feel good coming out of this if it's 2-0. You can feel good coming out of this if it's 8-0. You could feel bad coming out of it if it's 8-0, depending on how you score the 8 and how you look. Um yeah, I, I think you want to see quality in the way the team plays. I, I think you want to see the midfield trio build some togetherness, and, and this should be the group that you're expecting to to ride it out. I, I think what you're doing here is you'd like to have this group today in your lineup be the team that you think will give you the best chance to win the World Cup, one hundred percent. 
game two against Chile. No, I mean, I'm, I'm serious here because game two against Chile would be the one that, all right, if you're going to rotate and try to keep people fresh, do it there. Play your first choice 100%, the group that if the final was tomorrow, you would play. Play them today. Play them today so they can okay. build together. If you need to rotate to stay fresh against Chile, fine. Then you're fresh with this group again against Sweden, and then you go from there, and you only make changes as needed past that. I think that's important because you haven't yeah. seen a lot of that in the, the build-up games. For me, Sam Mewis is, is in the starting lineup. I, I think Sam Mewis is the midfielder who gives you the most balance between Ertz and Lavelle. And, and as great of a year as Lindsey Horan had in 2018, it, it's June of 2019 now, and she's had some injury issues. I'd rather have her come off the bench if you have to go for it more. Mewis gives you more balance because Mewis can get forward and contribute to the attack, but she can also drop and help Ertz. And she, I think she can drop, if Ertz has to drop even deeper, I think Mewis can drop in and, and do a suitable job. There is the, the only holding midfielder if you have to ad adjust things inside the match. I, I, I'm really, the more I've seen, the more that I feel that's the way to go. I don't know if that's the way Jill Ellis sees it. I don't know if that's where she's going to go with it because it, it's felt like it's been very much the midfield trio is... Haran and Lavelle in front of Ertz. I think Mewis is, is such an important piece of this, and, and you need her in from the start for balance as opposed to at the end of a match. That's where you can make a decision. If you're getting late in a match, do you need to go for it? Okay, you have options there to, to change and get more attacking in the central midfield, or do you need to sit back and hold it and you have Morgan Bryan who can come into that kind of role and drop in and play with Ertz. You have options to change it depending on what you need in the shorter time period. I think you want Sam Mewis to start. I would love to see the front three as we expect with Rapino, Morgan, and Tobin Heath. Behind them, Lavelle as the primary playmaker. Samantha Mewis as a, a box to box and an eight, a, kind of a flying eight, getting forward as much as she can. Julie Ertz holding in the midfield as the the base of that triangle, and then you're you're back four. That I mean, I I, th I think we're pretty settled on what the defense is going to look like. I do have a question when you get into the nitty gritty of it: Are you going to have to drop Julie Ertz to a center back role? If things start to fall apart against top competition, and we're not going to see that until you're there. You know, you're not going to get tested in these first two games. So you're only going to see, wow, we're not good enough defensively <laughs> at the moment where you have to be good enough defensively. So you have to have a, bla a backup plan. You have to have a plan that, all right, if Ertz goes to the back line because we're not solid enough, then what? And that's something that we're not going to know until you get punched in the mouth, whether it's Sweden, whether it's Spain, whether it's France, or, or beyond. So I think you have to roll with the back four and, and have Ertz protect them as much as she can and let the front five go. And for me, I just want to see a good play today. I'm, I'm, not, yeah. I'm not worried about the final score. I don't think the game's defined by how many goals the U.S. puts up. You want to see good play, you want to see organized play, and you want to see those combinations build. Yeah, no, I mean, that makes, that's, to me, that's what makes the most sense because to your point you said, and I agree with you, you could play well at 2-0, you could play well at 8-0, you could play poorly at either score. So I just, I'd like to see that first step in that first stage of development. And I like your idea about coming out of the blocks with the starting 11 and then making sure that in match we, in match day two, that you rotate out a little bit just so you can be prepared for the stretch run. So no, I, I completely see where you're coming from there. And but no, it's when you look at play well, it's you know I'll know it when I see it. But to me, don't get wrapped up in the score because it could be all over the place today. Yeah, score line doesn't define it. I mean, it could be a sloppy you know big win, and and that's not really what you're looking for for the U.S. Here, you're you're looking for you know. Strong moments of play, strong moments of build-up play, organization. 
You know, maybe in that Chile game in the first half, you start with Ertz in the back, whoever you think she'd be paired with, or if you want to try three in the back there to to give it a look and then change out of it in the second half, cool. But this one here in this game one, this is, in, in my opinion, needs to be your first choice lineup, your lineup to win the final if it's tomorrow. And then you work everything from there. We'll see. We'll talk more about it as we get a little bit deeper into the show. We'll also talk about Atlanta United and the Charleston Battery because that is this evening from MUSC Health Stadium in Charleston, South Carolina. Doug Robertson will be joining us at 1030 for his thoughts and a prediction. But up next, we're going to talk about the weekend that was in Major League Soccer Some big wins, uh, some surprising wins, and some huge performances as the league wrapped up the first half-ish of the schedule, and we'll be off for a couple of weeks. We'll get you caught up right after this. Looking for future leaders we can trust and believe in? Look no further than the high school student-athletes right here in Georgia. High school sports teach young people how to be effective leaders, It begins by making their grades and being on time for practice. It includes learning to listen, following directions, accepting responsibility, being a good role model. And it's about respect for officials, opponents, the rules, and each other. The result? It transcends sports. It gives us hope for the future. High school sports, there's so much more than just a game. This message presented by the Georgia High School Association and the Georgia Athletic Directors Association. Today's show is presented by Apolinsky & Associates, personal injury lawyers with over 30 years of experience, supporters of Atlanta United, Faction, and Inter-Atlanta Youth Football Club. If you've been hurt in a wreck, contact Steve today at steve at aa-legal.com or call him 24-7 at 404-377-9191. The initial consultation is free. We know that every driver is different, and a one-size policy does not fit all. That's why Country Financial offers a variety of discounts, so you get the coverage you need and the savings you deserve. From good driver to good student, multi-policy to multi-car, we've got a discount to suit every driver. Call Jason Wright at 678-568-6871 today to see what you could save. On Facebook at Jason Wright Agency or by phone at 678-568-6871. Discounts vary by state. Policies issued by Country Mutual Insurance Company, Country Preferred Insurance Company, or Country Casualty Insurance Company. Bloomington, Illinois. When John describes the flame that emerged from his grill as the Michael Jackson blue flame, um, yeah, you probably just shouldn't grill, man. Uh, I'm just (laughs) going to say that you either need a new grill or you just need to not grill. Like, Go get one of the little hibachis that's like a tabletop thing with some charcoal. Do that because I don't think you'll burn the house down that way. Well, I mean, it was open air, so I don't think I would have burned the house down. I probably would have just burned my hair. Well, when you have uh, Michael Jackson-esque flames, um, yes, that's not good. Something is is not the way it should be. So be more careful. How about that? Who are we talking to here? Be more careful for your neighbor's sake. How about that? See, now that would see. There you go. Looking out for others. Yes. That's that's what's important. That's what is very important. To heck uh, with what's left of my hair. Uh, look mean, out for your name hey i said be safe and you were like well look who you're talking to so then i have to try to find something else to get through so you're more safe so yes look out for the neighbors if that's what it takes that's what it takes all right let's get you caught up on the four games that happened over the weekend in major league soccer started off friday night 2-2 toronto and sporting kansas city toronto picks up a point which they needed Kansas City picks up another draw which they've been getting really good at as of late and it was a 95th minute goal from Jordan Hamilton for the point for Toronto um neither team is hitting on all cylinders right now 
So can't say I'm really surprised by the final result. Kansas City gets two goals from the spot from Felipe Gutierrez. Toronto gets a goal from Nick DeLeon. And then Jordan Hamilton with the stoppage time equalizer. Thoughts? The the trouble with the West continues for Toronto FC. And you know, Hamilton comes in replacing Terrence Boyd. You had Boyd and Pasuelo starting. And Boyd lasted all of fifty eight minutes. Jordan Hamilton comes in and you end up with a two two draw. And I still have more questions right now than I do answers when it comes to Toronto FC, but sporting for me just continues to get healthier. And I, I'm looking forward to a healthier sporting Kansas City side in the second half of the season after the international break. I want to see them continue to, to climb the table and do things in the West. But the problems for TFC against Western Conference teams continue. Yeah, there, there's nothing to, to base that on. Uh, that's why I, I kind of throw cold water on that. Like Western Conference teams don't scare Toronto more than anybody else. It's just a weird little quirk here. The bigger yeah. thing for Toronto is three losses in their last six. Um, they're scoring goals. They've scored 26 goals this season, but they've allowed 25. And when Toronto was the best team in the league, they were very good defensively first. I think any team in this league, to be elite, to be the best, you have to be strong defensively. I, I don't think you can win MLS Cup. You definitely can't win the Supporters' Shield if you are giving up that many goals. You just no. you cannot do it. So defensively, Toronto is going to have to figure some things out. Omar Gonzalez joins when the window opens in July. That should help. How much? We'll have to wait and see. Oh three and 3 in their last six, Toronto. Kansas City, 1-2-3. and three. Although they've only lost once in the last five, it it feels like they're starting to find something, but it's the same kind of story. I mean, they've scored goals all the way through, but they've given up 27 goals in 15 matches. They've had so many injuries. There's at least an, an explanation there. Uh, Toronto's had drew more out, but both teams just not good enough defensively. And 2-2 and is your final result there. It was also 2-2 at Avaya Stadium. San Jose and Dallas. Pretty entertaining match on Saturday afternoon. The first goal. <laughs> wow, Daniel Vega. Um, it happens. Uh -huh. Look, it's going to get make the rounds. It's going to, you know, it's the storyline. Every league, every country has this happen. It happens. Every goalkeeper has had this happen. It happens. You really don't want it to happen on a nationally televised match. You want it to happen on a match no. that's behind closed doors with nobody in the building. But Daniel Vega, with a, a horrendous mistake, to give up the first goal. But hey, San Jose bounces back, and they get two goals to start the second half. Wondolowski and Erickson. And then Dallas brings on Francis Atuene, and he gets a goal very soon after he comes on, and it finishes 2-2. Yeah, so uh, what was the DM conversation that I had with you in regard to this match? That was a long time ago. I don't remember. Who did I have as my starting goal, goalie in fantasy this week? Well, yeah, there wasn't a lot of options. I mean, but but that's the thing. is like It doesn't matter. Like He gave up a goal. It would have been the same as if uh, Atuene like, scored a, a bicycle kick where he did like three backflips. Like, it counts the same for you. It's not like you get more you know negative points because he gave up a goal himself but uh in a horrendous wando way. yes wando player of the month yeah i mean and, it's the amount of goal eight goals in the last four i mean yeah that's an easy one well, wasn't it eight in a row yeah he scored the, the eight goals in a row for san jose before erickson scored and uh, I just – San Jose for me is a fun team to watch. And I think that, you know, when, when you see – when we all were sitting there going, okay, it was going to take a while for San Jose to, to, to figure out what's going on. I think that if, if you had a coach of the year vote right now, where would Matias Almeida be in that voting? He's in the top three. I mean, it, it's, it's easy that he's a, near the top of it because of what he's done with a team that, honestly, I don't think the roster's all that great. And, you know, you compare the quality of play 
between San Jose and Vancouver. Two managers that are new, two managers with Almeida and with Mark Dos Santos who are trying to to build a team that can play the game they want. I, I think Almeida has been able to do more with the roster that doesn't suit what he wants to do ultimately than Vancouver has. And and Dos Santos has, has you know, righted the ship a bit. He's done okay. I think Almeida's been better. Um, this San Jose team is really interesting because they, they combine a lot of different elements. They are a team that will apply pressure to the opponent. They don't do it in the same way that other teams in the league do. They're a team that can also play with the ball at their feet. They're, they're, they're finding a balance between the two. That's very difficult. Can that be sustainable? We'll have to wait and see a little bit. Um, but so far, so far, so good for San Jose. Um, this is going to feel like points dropped, and this these are the types of matches that can take you, you know, out of a playoff picture. And right now, San Jose is in eighth. They are equal on points with Real Salt Lake, but they are behind them um, on wins. Real Salt Lake has six wins. San Jose has five. These are the ones that hurt in that regard. But one loss in your last six, if you're the Quakes. Almeida's getting it right going into the second half. And it's to, to see the, the evolution or development or whatever word you want to use when it comes to how he's doing things on the fly is, is, has been a treat to watch so far this season for me. Yeah. I mean, uh, Matias Almeida is, is doing some different things tactically in this league. It's, you know, for, for the press that they do, do use when they use it it's effective but they're also the number two team in possession in the league and it's very hard to be able to split your personality in that way and San Jose is just a really interesting team I want to see if they can sustain it I want to see when they get into the nitty-gritty of the schedule can they get into a playoff spot can they make some of these draws turn into wins I'm I'm intrigued by San Jose. They're one to definitely watch here in the second half because of of where they fall right now and just the 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 play that they're they're giving you week in and week out. Philadelphia yeah. is another team to watch because what Philadelphia has done in the last two weeks, two wins where they've had to come from behind. They had to come from behind multiple times against Minnesota. They had to come from two nil down against the Red Bulls, and it was at home. Il Senio with the super sub performance of all super sub performances, but back to back wins for the Union. They're four points clear at the top of the Eastern Conference right now. And I think in these last two weeks, the Philadelphia Union have made the statement that they're not going away. Yeah. For Il Senio in a 12 minute period, two goals and an assist. Assists on the Montero goal after checking in in the 54th for Brendan Aronson. So basically six minutes in, he gets the assist. And then a minute later, he scores from Bedoya and then wraps it up in the 72nd. And in looking at people's timelines about how crazy this match was with Red Bulls jumping out to that 2 nothing lead and having that at the break and then just the, the absolute craziness that happened in the first the first half of the second half. So basically, if you want to call it quarters, basically the third quarter of the match. Uh, you know, Philadelphia's not going away, and it's and it's matches like this that you can put you can put on your bookshelf and sit there and say, "See, we're capable of doing X, Y, and Z on any given match day." And I think that this is the one that you put in the frame and sit there and you can reference it all season long to sit there and say, hey, look, we, you know, a lot of folks are saying these things about us. This match proves to ourselves and to everyone else that we are capable of coming from behind doing the, you know, whatever cliche you want to use, the gut check kind of a thing. So, no, good for good for Philadelphia coming back the way that they did. And yeah, uh, I don't think I don't think they're going away anytime soon. Red Bulls had won four of the previous five, and they had a two 0 lead at halftime. Uh, Kaku and Brian White scored in the first half for the Red Bulls. 
And then, I mean, once El Seno checked in, and I, I've seen the people say, well, why doesn't he start? I, I don't think he could start. I don't think he's got the, the legs to start, and he's not going to be as effective. But as a second-half sub, the, the first goal he scored, the equalizer in the 61st minute, El Seno on the dribble, you know what's coming, and you still can't stop it. I mean, he's just in that type of run of form right now. And he's such an important part of this team. You know, you know you're going to make that sub around the, the 55th, 60th minute mark. He's going to play 30, 30 plus minutes in a match. That's probably what he has fitness wise. But he's so effective when he comes in that you can build your, your team around that. Now, you know, is that going to hurt you at some point? It could because you're basically going to use a sub, you know, going into the match, you know, okay. I'm going to play somebody for 55 to 60, and then El Seno is going to come in to finish it off. All right. If it's effective, that's that's what you're going to do. And El Seno right now is making all that work. So back-to-back wins for the Union after a, a little bit of a, a stumble where they only picked up two points out of three matches. They, they've got a little bit of a cushion. Now, Atlanta's five points back with two games in hand. You've got teams that are chasing NYC three games in hand, and they're eight points back. It's not going to be easy for Philadelphia, but when we talked about the Eastern Conference in the last week, and and I kind of feel like it's Atlanta, Red Bulls, and NYC that are the elite teams of the East, and Philadelphia and D.C. were in a category below that. Philadelphia's last two matches have pushed them into that elite category right now. They're the number two team in the Supporters' Shield race. They've been that good through their first half of the season, and they have played half of their league matches. They're 9-4-4. They're that good. They're they're one of the elites right now. Can they maintain it? We'll have to see. They're they're probably the weakest one of those teams defensively. And are they going to get the consistent goal-scoring production without Corey Burke? And with kind of a cast of character scoring goals, not really a you know a focal point. It's kind of a, a goals by committee type of approach for the union. Is it going to last? Right now, it's Atlanta, Philly, the two New York teams. Those are your top teams in the Eastern Conference. Philadelphia has earned that spot. No, I'm right there with you. And uh, the the question for me is, can Philadelphia maintain in the second half of the season? And so. That's you know all right. Until further notice, you're right there in the in the group. But can you maintain over the longer period of time? That for me is the question. Colorado Rapids, Connor Casey. Connor Casey effect. They win again three uh, one nil over Minnesota. Three points for the Rapids. Four two and one under Connor Casey. Anthony Hudson was 0-7-2 in his first nine of the season. Let Connor Casey finish the year out and then figure it out at the end of the year. I, I, yes. I, there's no reason not to do that right now. There is zero reason not to do that. I think Casey is is connecting with this group. He's had a, it's just a noticeable impact on the attitude of this team, the way they play. Nothing has dramatically changed. They did add, they did upgrade some pieces before the window closed. They added Jonathan Lewis. That helps. But they didn't go out and like sign a world-class designated player to make a change between Hudson and Casey. Connor Casey has had that effect. He should get to see the rest of the year out. And then you make a decision. If, if he can continue to have them climb up the table, he should get the job. Not definite now. You don't have to make that decision now. But he should get a chance to finish the year out. He's four points out of a playoff spot. Uh, just No, I'm with you. Give it to him. For the rest of the year, You know, just decide it later. You can keep the interim tag on, whatever tag you want to give him. Let him have it. But leave him alone for the remainder of the season because you're paying 38 coaches right now anyway, aren't you? Uh, you're paying too, yeah. So, yeah, I mean, you you look at the the difference with Colorado right now, and yeah, leave him alone. Let let him do his thing. Thirty one crosses for Minnesota. That I did not know in this match. 
defensively. I mean, Colorado, when when teams are putting in that many crosses, that's usually a bad sign. Yeah. 31-14 in crosses, and that's just... Yeesh. I mean, these have been some quality wins. Minnesota is number six in the Western Conference right now. You beat Cincinnati just like you should. You got a, a draw with Philadelphia at 1-1, which is a really good result. And that was in Philadelphia, by the way, for the Rapids. You beat the, the Columbus Crews 3-2, maybe a little bit dicier than you'd like it to be. And then you went to LA, LA Galaxy, who's number two in the West, and you beat them in their own house. Four wins out of the last five. For the Rapids, Connor Casey should get to see out the rest of the year and then figure it out once you get there if, if you want to keep rolling with him or if you want to make a decision. But four points out of a playoff spot, the Colorado Rapids are a team to keep an eye on in the Western Conference. We're going to take a break, come back, get into your Twitter Tuesday thoughts for a bit. Stay with us. We'll be right back. A ranger station. I'd like to report a bear hug. Okay. I put out my campfire and Smokey Bear hugged me. So you drowned the fire, you stirred it, drowned it again, and felt that it was cold? Uh Uh-huh. Yeah, but he's just letting you know you did good. Bear hug from Smokey Bear. Status update. I'm going to let you go now. There are many ways to start a fire, but one sure way to put it out. Learn how you can do your part at SmokeyBear.com. Sponsored by the U.S. Forest Service Ad Council and your state forester. As a business owner, you know that every year brings new challenges and opportunities. The success of your business demands expertise and focus. And Country Financial can help you keep that focus by helping ensure you have the right insurance protection in place to meet your goals. Jason Wright can help you create a customized insurance plan that has coverages designed just for your business. Give Jason a call at 678-568-6871 or reach him on Facebook at Jason Wright Agency. Coverages vary by state. Policies issued by Country Mutual Insurance Company, Bloomington, Illinois. This is what matters. This is beyond X's and O's. This is the difference mutual respect makes. This is what character looks like. This is what defines us in Georgia. This is sportsmanship. School sports, it's not the outcome that matters most, but the way the games are played. This message presented by the Georgia High School Association and the Georgia Athletic Directors Association. If you've been hurt in a car wreck, contact my friend Steve Apolinski of Apolinski and Associates. He's been representing individuals for over 30 years throughout Georgia and Alabama. Email him at steve at aa-legal.com or call him 24-7 at 404-377-9191. The initial consultation is free. Welcome back. Soccer down here, June 11th. Tuesday Thoughts. You've got Tuesday thoughts on the U.S. women's national team playing at 3 o'clock today against Thailand. You've got Tuesday thoughts against or about Atlanta United playing the Charleston Battery at 7.30 tonight. That one's on ESPN+. Plus. There is no radio broadcast. Yes, I'm sad. This is only the second game that I have not called for Atlanta United. Um, the Miami game in the Open Cup in 2017 was the other one. So, yeah, it, it stinks. Um, the full broadcast rights were packaged in the deal with ESPN Plus by U.S. Soccer. So uh, we tried everything we could try. No no way to, to do the game on local radio. So the only way you can watch is on ESPN Plus with our friend Poppy Miller, who will be on Play by Play, and Bobby Warshaw from MLSsoccer.com will be on color for that one. So... ESPN Plus is the, the the business for the game tonight. I'm going to watch over at uh, Grindhouse in Decatur. I, I really like Grindhouse's burgers. And okay, because I've never eaten there. Why am I not surprised? <laughs> and it's like in your neighborhood, too. It's so good. Yeah. Local, too. It, it's good stuff. Um, I used to go to the Grindhouse location at the Sweet Auburn Curb Market a lot when our soccer in the streets office was uh, about a block away, so... Uh, Grindhouse, uh, longtime supporter of soccer in the streets, of soccer in in the city of Atlanta. They have a, a pretty cool partnership with Footy Mob as well. So 
that was one of the suggestions and and our buddy Andy Bunker from 929 the game was like yeah I'm in let's do this so watching over at a uh, grindhouse tonight in Decatur looking forward to it it's going to be weird though like I'm I'm going to be like what's going on like I'm I'm just going to be like sitting there talking to myself uh with color commentary about things because you know that's what I do uh let's see Daniel Price this morning he says he's happy that can's getting uh, playing time but what's the reason behind gazan not being there is he injured hashtag match day concern no no injury it's just an opportunity to give uh somebody else a game in this and it's pr- pretty typical in cup competitions to to rotate your goalkeepers a bit i mean you see it at, at the the highest levels of the fa cup where goalkeepers will will get those early games in a competition and they'll even get the games all the way into the final sometimes so no injury concern with Gazan that, that I know of that's been reported. I think it's just an opportunity for Alec Can to, to get a game with the first team. And and I think that it's probably going to be Phil Breno in net for Charleston with uh, Joe Kosminski playing against Birmingham over the weekend. So, so Charleston's we'll see what in happens. It's a weird spot because, I mean, they're battling in, in the Eastern Conference. Their schedule is pretty difficult right now, and it feels like they're kind of rotating their squad – on, on both sides like it, it's a really weird thing like they've rotated their squad in some league games here uh, Mike Anhauser this time of year it feels like he just rotates the squad no matter what just to keep everybody fresh and he doesn't really change it for an open cup match so the lineup tonight could be I think it could be a little surprising on the battery side of things yeah uh to give you an idea the subs that he had against Birmingham over the weekend were Phil Breno, O'Brien Woodbine, Dante Marini, A.J. Patterson, and Svantesson. And it you wouldn't would surprise me. Svantesson and Woodbine, I think, to start for sure. I'm not yep. sure where Marini's fitness is coming back, um, if he's ready to go 90, but he would definitely be in the squad. Uh, Woodbine, with his you know veteran leadership, I would expect him to be there. Taylor Mueller, even though he played, I, I think he's uh, first coming choice all the time. Coming off a broken nose. Yeah. yeah, but you're you're not keeping him out of this one. Svantesson, nope. with his size up top, you're going to use him as your outlet to get out of trouble because you would expect if you're Charleston to come in here and not see a lot of the ball, um, Atlanta would have the possession battle for sure, and you're going to have to play long and direct. And when you have a guy in Svantesson who's, what, 6'6"? Six, six? I think he's bigger than that. Is he 6'7"? Does he get up to 6'7 officially? I think think yeah i think he's i think he's like nine feet tall no and no he's not that that would that that would be freakish that, that, that's not true but i think it's six six or six seven um depending on the length of the cleats he's wearing he's a big boy yeah and when you have that you can play out of trouble and you can just bomb it long to him and let him hold up and and bring people into the play and that's your that's your outlet it's a simple strategy it's an effective strategy it's a smart one so we'll see if that's what charleston does tonight what else we got on the Twitters? Yeah. Uh, let's see. Uh, Caleb Cook is looking forward to seeing the women's national team. He can't wait to watch the women kick it off today. Yeah, same. Uh, I mean, it's, Shiva, it's a weird schedule yeah. for the U.S. women just because of, of the way it falls with probably the least. I mean, I, I don't want to diminish Thailand here, but they're, they're huge underdogs. And I kind of wish you got Sweden first. And you had a chance to see, all right, our first choice, there's things wrong. We, we need to make some adjustments. Yeah. I, I kind of wish you had the schedule flipped a little bit where you got that game first. Because I don't know how much you're going to learn here. You're just looking for those connections and those combinations on the field. So I, I'm, I'm glad to see them get into the, the fray because that will be the last game for the the first set of games after the u.s thailand match everybody has played once then you start to get into all right can teams build on their first performance you know what changes do they have to make if they didn't get a result in the first match then we start to get into the progress side of it so just glad the u.s is finally getting their first game uh shiva wants to know anyone listened to the end of parkey's interview on 92.9 yesterday this is what he had to say about charleston quote frankly they're not good enough end quote i love the spirit let's go united let's go usa on paper no 
I mean, that's that, that's a fact. I mean, players are, are in the USL championship because they are not seen as being major league soccer players. Some can make it there and some can make it into different teams and fit into different teams there. Absolutely. But yeah, when you're talking about a first division team and a second division team, yes, what Michael Parker said is 100% true. What's going to be interesting in this one in terms of the difference between the last two times these teams faced off in the Open Cup? Last two times it was Charleston coming over here playing at Kennesaw. This time you're going into Charleston's house. There's going to be a different, I think, bit of pride there from the battery. I think they're going to be up for it. I think they're going to play above their heads a bit. You can't let them grow into it. And that's the trick for me in these types of games. You can't let the lesser team grow into the game. You can't let them, you know, just it literally, like you kind of can see it sometimes in some of these small teams where they come in and they're, you know, they almost play like they're a little shy. They're, they're a little, little worried about being on the ball too long. And the longer it stays, nil nil. And when they can find some positives, yep. you start to see them stand up a little bit taller. A chest comes out a little bit more where it's like, all right, we can play here. We're good. This is just like a normal match for us. You can't let them get to that point. You can't let them get an early goal to, to then be able to sit back and defend. And Charleston can do that. Mike Anhauser, that's, that's been part of his MO for years. Is they're, they're a tough team to break down. You need to get the first goal, you need to get it early, and you need to take control of this game early and put Charleston on their heels. You don't want to let them start to believe that they can play on the same field. Yes. Yes, that's that's the thing is belief. Get the early goal and keep the belief as far away from the the uh, lower division side in any of these matchups as possible. Don't let the lower division side grow into the match. Chris Berry. Just a heads up, although an amazing smoker, the big green egg sometimes burps when you open it. I've singed myself on a big green egg. Oh, okay. You might have some problems with that then, John. Oh, yeah. Got to be Tafka. careful. We need to find a, like an, a, yes. an anti-singing grill for, for John. A, a, non-singeable, a non-singing grill. Tafka. And I don't know the genesis of this because there was no previously linked to tweet. It says the previously alluded to article and podcast discussion topic is about done can give us good long discussions like one topic per day in the FIFA break for the next week. I think I solved all of MLS problems and questions with this. Uh, he is referencing an article that he was going to write a while back. So if it's almost done, then... Okay, and send it our way, and we will uh, have at it. And maybe we break it up and release it as we talk about it. I don't know. I got to see it first. So send it over when it's ready. Okay. Yes. Uh, Joe Boss. And, and I actually got hashtag here. Uh-oh. So, uh, yeah, it says uh, hashtag John scares the hell out of me. Yes. With his grilling episodes. Yes. Good morning, by the way. Yes. Hoping the U.S. women's national team just win and gets out healthy. Yes. Yes. Uh, all of the above, So yes, yes, yes and yes. Uh, all, all is correct from Joe Bost. The, the fact that uh, I scare the hell out of him? Uh, yeah. When you're talking about Michael Jackson flames, yes. That's uh, not what is supposed to happen here. No. Uh, Shiva again. What has changed with Philly this year? Is it switching to a different style of play? Yeah, it has. Um, they have changed their style a bit, and, and I've seen some people describe it as like Red Bull's light. I, I don't know if I'd go quite that far. I think when you start with it and you look at what Philadelphia is doing, they're playing in a four four two diamond, and. Everybody went insane about, you can't do that, can't do that after Toronto beat them in, in week one. Well, <laughs> it's, it's working, and they didn't make any dramatic changes out of it either. Um, to me, when you look at the way they played, and we'll, we'll, we'll go with the lineup against Red Bulls, their last one, 
you got your back four and out wide you have Kai Wagner who has become one of the best left backs in the league. It was a really good signing uh, from Ernst Tanner, pulling him out of the second division in Germany. He's, he's a perfect fit. He can get up and down the line. And in a four four two diamond, you need your outside backs to be able to provide that width. He's doing it. Raymond Gaddis on the other side. Speed. He's doing that on the right side. You've been doing a lot of this without Mark McKenzie, who, who's been out most of the season, and it's been Jack Elliott who is finding his form from 2017. Jack Elliott's been really, really good this year, uh, paired with Austin Trusty. Harris Madunian sit in front of them, and after that Toronto game, everybody said, nope, can't have Harris Madunian by himself. Can't do that. Going to have to pair it up. They figured it out, and it's Bedoya, and let's not – I think diminish the addition of Jamero Montero to play in one of those kind of eight roles. In a diamond, you're looking at it as a six, as two eights, two shuttlers, because that way the the four four two can turn into a four three one two when you're defending, when they have to drop and help. It can also turn into a four one three two when they're able to step up and get high. Bedoya and Montero have made the right decisions and read the game well in when to drop, when to go. They're not really getting caught out. Brendan Aronson has come in and and replaced Marco Fabian, who's had injury problems. Fabian uh, tried to join the Mexican national team, injured, can't do it. Aronson has kind of come out of nowhere. He got his first start against Atlanta in that draw here at Mercedes-Benz Stadium, and He's maybe one of the misses for Tab Ramos and the U-20 national team. Aronson was a guy that I thought might have played his way into it. He's been outstanding. And then, you know, it's been a bit of a rotating cast up top, but two strikers up top that are, are doing the job for Philadelphia. They're, they're picking their spots when to press, but they're defending well, and they're getting forward, and they're creating chances, and they're scoring goals. So Philadelphia in this 4-4-2 took a little bit of time to master it. I don't know if I'd say they've completely mastered it, but it's working well, and it's because of that midfield for me. It's, it's Madunian and Bedoya, Montero and Aronson, or Fabian when he's available. That's the the engine room for Philadelphia, and that's why they're doing so well. And the last question on the Twitters is from Daniel Price, and he wants to know if everyone is invited to Grindhouse for the viewing. Well, yeah, it's, it's, a, it's, a, public, it's a public place. Please, come, come on out and hang out. Um, we're not doing any kind of a broadcast or anything like that. So no, we're just hanging out and having a meal. Just hanging out, eating a burger, and watching the game. That's, that's the, the, the business here tonight, so looking forward to it. It's still going to be weird, though. I'm just, yeah, I, I don't know. Like, that, that Miami game... I I just watched it at home. I didn't go out and watch it anywhere. So this is just strange. I don't know. Yes. It, it's a it's a weird feeling to not be in Charleston doing this. And I get it with the broadcast rights. I, I was hoping there would be a way to, to make it work. Um, it's, it is what it is. I, I feel like it's a little bit of a lost opportunity because there are – and it's not just us. I mean, we're not the only ones. There were plenty of MLS teams who would have broadcast this on their local radio partners. And I feel like it's limiting the coverage a bit. But hopefully it's something that can be worked out in the future and, and figure out how to get radio coverage. Because there are people who like to listen to games on the radio. There are people who like to have the local call synced up with a, with a stream or with a TV broadcast. So hopefully it's something that can get addressed down the road. But the deal has overall been good for U.S. soccer. It's been good for the Open Cup. It will continue to be that because all these games are in one place. They're easy to watch. You have high-quality production with Vista doing the streams out of Fort Lauderdale. It's a big step in the right direction. The, the radio part is just a, a bit of a disappointment and maybe a little bit of an oversight. So we'll see if that changes down the road. Let's take a break. Come back for hour number two. We'll take more of your questions. We're also going to look at what other games are going on in the Lamar Hunt U.S. Open Cup this evening and doug robertson from the atlanta journal constitution joins us at 10 30 we'll be right back looking for future leaders we can trust and believe in look no further than the high school student athletes right here in georgia high school sports teach young people how to be effective leaders it begins by making their grades and being on time for practice it includes learning to listen following directions accepting responsibility being a good role model and it's about respect 
for officials, opponents, the rules, and each other. The result? It transcends sports. It gives us hope for the future. High school sports. There's so much more than just a game. This message presented by the Georgia High School Association and the Georgia Athletic Directors Association. Today's show is presented by Avalinsky and Associates, personal injury lawyers with over 30 years of experience, supporters of Atlanta United, the faction, and Inter Atlanta Youth Football Club. If you've been hurt in a wreck, contact Steve today at steve at aa-legal.com or call in 24-7 at 404-377-9191. The initial consultation is free. We know that every driver is different, and a one-size policy does not fit all. That's why Country Financial offers a variety of discounts, so you get the coverage you need and the savings you deserve. From good driver to good student, multi-policy to multi-car, we've got a discount to suit every driver. Call Jason Wright at 678-568-6871 today to see what you could save. On Facebook at Jason Wright Agency or by phone at 678-568-6871. Discounts vary by state. Policies issued by Country Mutual Insurance Company, Country Preferred Insurance Company, or Country Casualty Insurance Company. Bloomington, Illinois. You're listening to Soccer Down Here Daily on SDH Networks, a division of OSG Sports. Find us at Soccer Down Here on Facebook and Twitter. The time is now the top of the hour. Peep, y'all. Welcome back. Hour number two, Soccer Down Here, June 11th edition. It's a Tuesday Thoughts edition. It's a match day edition for the U.S. Women's National Team and for Atlanta United. It's a match day edition for the Lamar Hunt U.S. Open Cup as well. We have six other games tonight with the rest tomorrow in the fourth round. Let's kind of run through them real quick so you know what the table looks like. And you can flip around on ESPN+. And there's a few in the evening that you can watch after the Atlanta-Charleston match as well. It all kicks off at 7 o'clock with the Columbus crew hosting the Pittsburgh Riverhounds. Pittsburgh comes in not exactly lighting things on fire as of late, 2 1 and 3 since the beginning of May in all competitions. We know Bob Lilly's teams with the Riverhounds are generally good defensively. They're well organized, they're tough to break down. They have not been a team that has been very expansive in the way they play. They're not going to score a ton of goals here. Columbus comes in not really doing much of anything either. This is a weird game that I could honestly see go either way. Yeah, and the your your description of Pittsburgh's offense, I thought that that was that that's about as perfect a word as you can get. It's not very expansive. And you know, after this midweek match, then they turn around and come down here for a matchup against Atlanta United 2 on Saturday night. And with Columbus not doing a whole lot and Pittsburgh by nature not doing a whole lot, I could honestly I could see I could see Pittsburgh having a, a definitely more than a puncher's chance in this one going up against Columbus because of Columbus's recent run of play. Well, Pittsburgh 100% will have a puncher's chance here because Columbus is missing Jossie's artist. They're missing Will Trapp. They're missing Zach Steffen now for good. They're, they have a lot of players who will not be there that have carried this team and they haven't carried them very far this season. So Pittsburgh comes in. They're 1-2-3 and three away from home. They have not been good this season, but... Up top, it's going to be down to Kevin Kerr, Nico Brett as your potential goal scorers. Those are the only players in the squad for the Riverhounds that have more than one goal on the season. It's, it is it is not very expansive. So we'll see what the Riverhounds can do. I think they throw everything at the wall here because they have an opportunity to advance. This mm-hmm. is a, a very winnable game for Pittsburgh. And that will be a good situation for Atlanta United, too, when they see them this weekend, because I don't think Pittsburgh's a very deep team. But they need to go for this one. This is a a game they can go win on the road. 
on an all MLS battle from Montclair State University Soccer Park, the home of Red Bulls 2. It's the Red Bulls hosting New England Revolution 730 kick. Curious to see what the lineups look for both teams here. It feels yes. like, whereas Frank DeBoer talked about not wanting to rotate a lot, and from what we've seen of the squad that went over to Charleston, you are seeing guys like Franco Escobar, Eric Rometty. Um, you're seeing a lot of first-choice guys, Miles Robinson. I don't know if the Red Bulls and the Revolution will have as much of that, although I feel like the Revolution could benefit from going with closer to a first-choice as Bruce Arena has now just taken charge, and you have an opportunity to build a little bit over this next couple of weeks. Well, then let me ask you this. Since Arena is the new guy, would not one of the best ways to get acquainted with the guys that you have on your roster in an Open Cup situation is to put something as close to what you would like to have as a first-choice lineup out there? I would, but Bruce Arena is also a manager who's never taken the Open Cup seriously. So historically, he his LA Galaxy teams had some like, head scratching upsets where yes. they would get beat in the Open Cup because they didn't take it seriously. This is a completely different situation. I think he should take advantage of it. Don't know if he will. And then on the Red Bull side, I mean, we talk about it all the time. You can plug and play a bit here. So you've got a number of players with Red Bulls, too, that you could plug into a team here because you can sign guys who are on USL contracts. You can sign them to short-term deals to play in the Open Cup. So the Red Bulls could rest a lot of their first-choice players if they so choose and play guys who are comfortable playing in the system. And Red Bulls, too, as we saw firsthand at Fifth Third Bank Stadium over the weekend, Red Bulls, too, are very good. Very organized. John Wolinick does an amazing job with that group, and they would be just fine slotting in second choice. They'd probably be in a better situation than most teams in that regard. Yeah. Yeah. And not knowing off the top of my head uh, who is on a USL contract and who isn't, but I mean, you could have folks like a Tom Barlow or an Epps or a Cassettis or things well, like that. Here's and- the thing about Red Bulls, too, that because a lot of those are on, on MLS deals. The only ones you can't call up are players who are on academy deals. So anybody who's played with Red Bulls, too, that is on a professional deal, whether it's on a MLS deal or on a USL deal, they could play here. It's only the guys like Esposito came in the second half uh, on Saturday Mauer. and some of the other guys. They can't because they're not pros. If you're on right. a pro deal with the Red Bulls organization, you could be on this roster with whatever paperwork that needs to happen. We probably won't know what they're doing in that regard until maybe right before the, the lineup comes out. I haven't seen any announcements already about players being signed to short-term deals. So, yeah, If you're the Red Bulls, you've got a lot of flexibility here. You should be able to take care of business. Um, the only question is, does New England go with as close to a first-choice lineup as they can to try to continue to build some continuity under Bruce Arena. Yeah. Out in Texas, yeah, and- Houston hosting the Austin Bold. Now, <clears> Pittsburgh <throat> struggled since the beginning of May. Austin's had a lot of games since the beginning of May, but they're 4-3-3. Three, and three. They kind of struggled early on in the season. The Dynamo are the defending cup champions. I think they will field as strong of a lineup as they can, but that's going to be difficult with some guys away on international duty. Can Austin pull off an upset here? I would say, yeah. I mean, when it comes to these, the, this round of Open Cup, you, you look at this intersection of hemispheric competitions, international play, all these kinds of things, and I give a lot of the, the lower division teams opportunities tonight. And Austin, for me, would be one of those because of the absences that you have with Houston. So, I mean, I'm I'm looking at, yeah, I'm looking I'm looking at you, Austin. You know, I'm, I'm looking at Pittsburgh because of their absence, because of the Columbus run of play, and because of who's not there anymore. So, Austin and Pittsburgh for me are the two that stick out right now as those that really could uh, move on to the next round because of what we're seeing going on right now. Austin's a better team than Pittsburgh. It's not even close. I think Pittsburgh gets lucky because of the opponent, but Austin, 
when you look at a team that has starters consistently like Amobi Akugu, who has played a lot of matches in Major League Soccer, Jermaine Taylor, a whole lot of matches in Major League Soccer, Callum Malice, another player with a lot of experience. You're getting a lot of goals out of Chris Tierpak, five starts on the season, four goals. You have a player in Sonny Guadarrama who with 10 starts this year that I really like in the midfield. I think he's the one who's going to kind of set the pace for this group. This is a good Austin Bold team, and it's a team with a lot of experience, a lot of players who have been here and done that in the Open Cup. They know what it's going to take tonight going into Houston, and if, if Houston is not able to hit the ground running with their changes to their lineup, Austin could pull a, a big surprise. So the bold one four and two away from home. That's that's a concern. One two and two in their last five in league play. But since the beginning of May, four three and three overall in all competitions. Austin has a team that can pull an upset in the Open Cup. They, but is they it can. an upset? Yeah. Uh, Yes, it's an upset. It's a USL Championship team beating a Major League Soccer team in their building. It's 100% an upset. Lower division teams beating top division teams, it's always an upset. Okay. It is. How How is it not? I'm just saying because of absences. That's what I'm looking at. Yeah. The absences from the, the upper division club. Yeah, but still, that, that can't. that's not an out anymore. Houston seven three and three. They're six zero and three at home. They have not lost a game in their building all season. They lose to the Austin Bold. It's one hundred percent upset, and it's an embarrassment. Doesn't matter how many people you're missing. You can't allow that to happen if you're the Houston Dynamo. So they have to find a way. They did last year, and they won this thing. And they were missing guys last year at different points in the tournament. So I, I'm I'm of the opinion that Major League Soccer teams now. There's no excuses for that, that, ah, we're missing three guys, so yeah, we can't play with a USL championship team. No. Yes, USL championship's better, but no, that's not an acceptable excuse anymore. you got to find a way, and especially if you're the defending champions of the tournament. you, you got to find a way, and, and I think the Dynamo do, but I think Austin's a team that will make them work for every bit of the result tonight. Next one, it's at 8.30. It is live from Lindenwood University in St. Charles, Minis- or St. Charles, Missouri. St. Louis hosting the Chicago Fire. St. Louis has been struggling lately. They started out really well in USL Championship play, but since the beginning of May, 1-1-3. One, one, and three, They're coming into this off of a loss to the Hartford Athletic. Chicago should take care of business, and, and we've seen Chicago historically, and we saw it last year. They take this tournament seriously. I think they will feel as as close to a first choice lineup as they can, depending on anybody who's out. And I think they take care of business against St. Louis. Uh, St. Louis is an organized team. I don't think St. Louis is a very dynamic team, and Chicago can take advantage of that. Yeah, no, I'm with you there, and uh, I'm you know obviously it's been a bit of an adventure for St. Louis to try to find places to play with everything that's gone on weather wise. But no, I think that, uh, I think that St. Louis gets their, uh, that gets their appearance in, but they end up on the losing end tonight. Yeah. They're three, one and one at home this season. And when you look at St. Louis, you know, they're, they're just not scoring a lot of goals and you're, you're leading to score Sam Fink, you know, who, who's not a goal scorer predominantly. Russell Cicerone, a midfielder. Kyle Gregg is the only other player with more than one goal on the season. You're not getting goals out of Gregg on a regular basis, out of Caleb Calvert on a regular basis. It, it's just a team that struggles for chances. And Chicago, in my opinion, should be able to punish that and, and take care of business here. 10 o'clock, another all MLS battle. Real Salt Lake hosting LAFC at Rio Tinto. I don't know what both teams are going to field in this one. This is kind of the the wild card match of, of all of it because both teams will have some absences potentially. I, I don't know how first choice either team goes, but this matchup does have a bit of emotion to it. It's had some rivalries since RSL knocked LAFC out of the playoffs last year. And Bob Bradley, when it comes to LAFC, has never been afraid to play younger players and have them as a part of his 18s and, and throw them into the fire. So, uh, you know, 
for me, I'm looking at, at LAFC in this one. Just, I mean, and I know that, you know, we look at uh, RSL and their USL championship side and how there's that, that oneness there as well. But you know, I, I'm, I'm still looking at LAFC in this one, even though the, I'm looking at this one being somewhat spicy when it comes to uh, viewing habits. Yeah, that oneness is very different than, than what we talked about with the Red Bulls when it comes to RSL. They have a very talented uh, second team with Real Monarchs, and it, it wouldn't be a surprise at all to see some Monarchs players with RSL in this one. But stylistically, it's not as easy as a plug-and-play situation. And I'm curious with some of the RSL players who were called into the U23 camp. So, you know, a player like Bofo Salcedo is, is not going to be available here. And that's that's a lot of potential absences for Real Salt Lake. They don't have a ton of depth. I think they are going to be relying on some Monarchs players. And it's just going to be out of both teams with young guys getting opportunities. Who's going to step up and grab it? And who's going to push their team on to the next round? This is the hardest one to, to call because of that. Yeah. I think RSL being at home probably finds a way. And I, I don't think LAFC really cares about that too much i think they'll be fine yeah they they don't advance but lafc does have talent throughout their roster can they start to show that some of these guys are ready if they need to be called upon talent's one thing playing and rhythm is another and and lafc hasn't had to to dig too deep into the depth chart are they going to be able to do that tonight Final game of the night, 10.30. It is at Avaya Stadium in San Jose, California. The Quakes are hosting the Sacramento Republic. The Republic come in 5-3-0 and since the beginning of May in all competitions. They've started to find a bit of a groove. They're 3-2-0 and in their last five. They're 3-4 and away from home, which is a, a kind of a surprising number here. And Sacramento is led by their leading goal scorer with seven in 11 USL championship appearances, Cameron Iwasa. Beyond that, you know, it's a team with maybe not a ton of MLS experience, but a team that has a lot to try to prove going into this one. Yeah. And I want, I want to see how, I want to see what the earthquakes look like after this past weekend. And I want to see what uh, roster is, is put out there by Matias Almeida. I mean, we've seen Sacramento in years past make cup runs and not flinch when it comes to their opposition that they have out there in the West when they're in their, their Western bracket in open cup. So I, I think that this one could have some, uh, could have some spiciness to it, but I'm still looking at San Jose by the time that we're done. Yeah, your other players for the Republic to keep an eye on. Jordan McCrary, who started with New England, played with Seattle, uh, originally from Columbus, Georgia. Jaime Villarreal came up through the Galaxy organization. Stefano Bonomo came up through the Red Bulls organization. Some guys who were in MLS but didn't really see a lot of time there. This feels like a statement game for Sacramento, and I do think that Almeida will rotate his squad and give his young guys an opportunity. Sacramento could take advantage. Sacramento, yeah. I don't think, is going to be scared by this one at all, and they no. could come in and pull a surprise. I would actually pick the Republic to win this. Okay, and uh, so so we'll be we'll be split on that one. But I think I think that I'm seeing San Jose pull it through in a tight one in a very tight affair, and you've got the flip side with Sacramento, but. Now, it would not surprise me a bit knowing Sacramento's pedigree when it comes to Open Cup and playing MLS sides in the past. That will help them a lot. And and just the fact that out of the USL championship teams that are playing tonight, I think Sacramento's the best one. I think they're the team that's most likely to pull a surprise. And if you're going to see one, I think it'll be at San Jose. Uh, Pittsburgh's the other one just because Columbus has been so poor lately and they're going to be missing a lot of pieces. Um not as much about Pittsburgh as for the reason why they could pull the upset as it is about Columbus. Sacramento, it would be about Sacramento being that good. Let's take a break, come back, get a couple questions from you guys off the Twitters, and then we'll have Doug Robertson from the Atlanta Journal-Constitution help us get ready for Atlanta and Charleston tonight. Hang out with us. We'll be right back. A ranger station. I'd like to report a bear hug. Okay. I put out my campfire and Smokey Bear hugged me. So you drowned the fire, you stirred it. Drowned it again and felt that it was cold? Uh Uh-huh. 
Yeah, but he's just letting you know you did good. Bear hug from Smokey Bear. Status update! I'm gonna let you go now. There are many ways to start a fire, but one sure way to put it out. Learn how you can do your part at SmokeyBear.com. Sponsored by the U.S. Forest Service Ad Council and your state forester. As a business owner, you know that every year brings new challenges and opportunities. The success of your business demands expertise and focus. And Country Financial can help you keep that focus by helping ensure you have the right insurance protection in place to meet your goals. Jason Wright can help you create a customized insurance plan that has coverages designed just for your business. Give Jason a call at 678-568-6871 or reach him on Facebook at Jason Wright Agency. Coverages vary by state. Policies issued by Country Mutual Insurance Company, Bloomington, Illinois. This is what matters. This is beyond X's and O's. This is the difference mutual respect makes. This is what character looks like. This is what defines us in Georgia. This is sportsmanship. School sports, it's not the outcome that matters most, but the way the games are played. This message presented by the Georgia High School Association and the Georgia Athletic Directors Association. If you've been hurt in a car wreck, contact my friend Steve Apolinski of Apolinski and Associates. He's been representing individuals for over 30 years throughout Georgia and Alabama. Email him at steve at aa-legal.com or call him 24-7 at 404-377-9191. The initial consultation is free. Welcome back. Soccer down here, June 11th. Tuesday thoughts on the Twitters. What do we have? Okay, Daniel, who I'm guessing is making travel plans for this evening to hang out with us at Grindhouse. A friend of mine from Philly that I haven't seen in a while. First thing he says to me in the tune of uh, Five Nation Army, and then he corrected himself, the Seven Nation Army. And apparently they now have a song that's, oh, top of the table. Philly's killing it. I need a retort to him. Yeah, I don't think they have a song that they've started singing. I mean, that that really takes about 15 seconds of thought. Okay. Well, in that 15 seconds of thought, uh, Daniel was wondering if there was any kind of a retort that they could, um, that, that he could come up with. First off, tell him to, to get a song that's not the most overplayed in the history of sports. Ugh. To uh, tell him to be more original than, than pulling out something like that. And three, if you're going to come up with a retort to music, uh, pick something good like Outkast or T.I. Yeah, so... Because, I mean, honestly... Uh, the White Stripes have nothing to do with Philadelphia, and that's just lame. They can do better. There's a lot of great Philadelphia artists that they could reference and do some witty little thing about being top of the table. Daniel Price, your friend has picked out a lame song and a lame thing to do to try to get under your skin. Yes. So, I mean, even if it was something like uh, TSOP, like The Sound of Philadelphia, I mean, something from... Motown or Soul or something like that. I think that would be. Well, Motown would that, be uh, another city altogether. Well, yeah. Well, who is it? Uh, or I guess, sorry, disco is, I guess, what I'm looking for. The Sound of Philadelphia. Well, no, no. I mean, the the group, The Sound of Philadelphia, yes, but like the the style of music, no. Uh, tell them to reference Meek Mill next time. So, uh, TSOP or. Anything else out of Philly or something like that? People are frantically Googling what you're talking about. Great horn section from the 1970s. TSOP, the sound of Philadelphia. (laughs) Uh, What else do we have on the Twitters? From the Soccer for Good OG. Can we talk about coded language used by TV commentators? Ooh, okay. Athletic. Interesting. Aggressive. Chaotic. OOG and I notice it all the time. Can we expand the descriptors to include smart, skillful, patient, etc.? It's yeah. It, it, I think it can be a a lame thing to fall back on. Um, and yeah, I think sometimes it is coded. And I'm assuming we're probably. I did not get to watch the broadcast of Canada and Cameroon. 
but I'm assuming there's probably some of it from that and, and other matches throughout the, the women's world cup. I, I don't know. I've, I've never thought that way. It's just not how, yeah. how I think, um, to me, I mean, there are players who are, are fast and they come from every part of the world and there are players who are slow and they come from every part of the world. And there's, you know, teams that are skillful and play a certain way. And then there's teams that are chaotic from again, all different parts of the world. It's a tricky thing. I mean, is there a, a stereotype of African teams at the world cup? I think there is. Is it 100% wrong? No, it's not. It, it, it can be a crutch at times, though. Um, Cameroon has been chaotic at times in the World Cup, both on the men's and the women's side in the way that they play. But they've also had unbelievable skill and talent on both. And, and their top players on the women's side are just very good, well-rounded soccer players. And I don't think it, it is strictly down to their athleticism. I think when you take it a step further and you look at a country like Cameroon and, and I, I zero in on Cameroon because in the 1990 world cup, you know, I, I didn't know anything about Cameroon as a country, as a 13 year old, let alone as a soccer team. And they beat Argentina in the first game of that tournament. And that quarterfinal with Cameroon and England is one of my all-time favorite matches. It's an unbelievable match. And when I watch that back, one, I'm, I'm blown away by the fact that goalkeepers could pick the ball up. I, I keep forgetting that that changed in going into 94 where goalkeepers couldn't just pick the ball up on a pass back. I, I was watching highlights from this the other day, and I'm like, what? Oh, yeah, that's right. It's just crazy. You, did Cameroon you go? Team, you went down the Amazon Prime hole, uh, rabbit hole again? No, this was just a different one. Um, but that Cameroon team was just a really good team. They were they were balanced. They they could get forward quickly, but they could defend with numbers. They were they were physical. Um, they were strong in the tackle, but they were very organized. Now, have other teams since with Cameroon not been as organized? Have been chaotic? Yeah. And a lot of it for them comes down to the fact that the Federation has really struggled with resources. They've hired managers at the last minute. They haven't had time to, to prepare, and it feels chaotic. And, and that's part of the story, and that needs to be talked about. That's the, the part here is that when you look at the difference yesterday with Canada and Cameroon and preparation, Canada's played a ton of games to prepare for this and they they've had their manager in place and they've had this group in place they know what they're doing as an organization they're very organized preparing for a tournament cameroon has been to the tournament before but they didn't play much in the lead up they the the program goes dormant from time to time because there's no money to fund it and the team is not as well organized because of that. And if you're going to talk about them not being organized, you have to talk about the why. And it's not just Cameroon. It's been a variety of countries in this tournament. Brazil has that issue from time to time. Jamaica, we've talked about their resource issues. I hope that this tournament starts to see some changes when you hear about things like well, Argentina went through it too, and Argentina is yeah. finally starting to turn the corner. But when you talk about things like the England Scotland game was the most watched women's match in the history of UK television, when things like the Telemundo study come out yesterday to say that Latina women, Latinas, are are blowing up the viewing, the interest in women's soccer, something that ten years ago you might not have said was the case. But now it is the Latinas who are driving interest in the women's game at greater percentages and greater rates than non-Latinas. That's massive. And, and you're going to start to see change. This feels like a tournament that can blow everything up in that regard. And then these countries and these teams don't come in unprepared and don't come in with that. I, I do get the coded language part, and it's a really tough thing, I, I think, for some commentators to get away from. I I try really hard when 
And it's something I feel like you kind of have to. It, it does get in, in my head when you describe a player as athletic or you know whatever stereotype we're, we're getting to. If if I'm you, if it's not even using a stereotype because if I'm just describing a player who's athletic at, because they're athletic, I try to go a step further if it is a known stereotype. Yeah, I, I try not to leave it at that. Does that make sense? I hope it does. Yeah, um, no, it's it's. Because we use certain words a lot of the time, if you back up the use of the adjective with evidence, then I think it carries more weight in using that word initially than just sitting there and using the word and not giving an explanation as to why. Yeah, I, I try to hit that. And I also try to, to reference, you know, that, look, not all African players are fast. Not all South American players are, are technical and skilled, and not all European players are smart. <laughs> you know, I mean, players are players. Every team yeah. has individuals that, that make this up. So I, I, I do think it'll change. I, I hope it does. But I hope that, too, you know, sometimes when a, a player is described as athletic, it, it's just because they're athletic. It's just because they're athletic, and when a player is, you know, does something in a very intelligent manner, it's described that way. It's tricky. Um, it's something that I, I try to keep in mind as best I can. And you know, in the flow of a game, sometimes things get lost in the shuffle. But it's definitely something I do think about, and I think most commentators do. I don't. I don't think anybody's coming in with that mindset, but. It's it's not an easy thing to do. So um, that's an interesting question. I'll be curious to to pay more attention to that as the tournament goes on because I think the other thing too that's hard about the women's World Cup is that you have a lot of teams and a lot of players that just aren't seen on a regular basis. You know, you don't have that huge depth of knowledge on how they play, where they play, what their background is. It's more difficult. Um, it feels a little bit more like an Olympics type of coverage where it's it's stuff that you don't see on a regular basis. I I think the women's game will get past that pretty quickly, and I hope it does because I would like to be able to watch Lyon more because they're an amazing club team. I'd like to watch the NWSL more. It all needs to be more accessible so we can have deeper conversations about the players and the teams that are involved. Let's uh After that very deep thought, I like that. Good one from Jill. Let's uh, let's take a break. Let's come back, get Doug Robertson on the line. We'll talk Atlanta, Charleston, and get you ready for the match from the Low Country after this. Looking for future leaders we can trust and believe in? Look no further than the high school student athletes right here in Georgia. High school sports teach young people how to be effective leaders. It begins by making their grades and being on time for practice. It includes learning to listen, following directions, accepting responsibility, being a good role model. And it's about respect for officials, opponents, the rules, and each other. The result? It transcends sports. It gives us hope for the future. High school sports. There's so much more than just a game. This message presented by the Georgia High School Association and the Georgia Athletic Directors Association. Today's show is presented by Apolinsky & Associates, personal injury lawyers with over 30 years of experience, supporters of Atlanta United, Faction, and Inter-Atlanta Youth Football Club. If you've been hurt in a wreck, contact Steve today at steve at aa-legal.com or call in 24-7 at 404-377-9191. The initial consultation is free. We know that every driver is different, and a one-size policy does not fit all. That's why Country Financial offers a variety of discounts, so you get the coverage you need and the savings you deserve. From good driver to good student, multi-policy to multi-car, we've got a discount to suit every driver. Call Jason Wright at 678-568-6871 today to see what you could save. On Facebook at Jason Wright Agency or by phone at 678-568-6871. Discounts vary by state. Policies issued by Country Mutual Insurance Company, Country Preferred Insurance Company, or Country Casualty Insurance Company. Bloomington, Illinois.
Welcome back. Soccer down here, June 11th. And on the road again, it's Doug Robertson driving down I-20 headed to Charleston. What's up, Doug? Oh, just, as you said, driving down the road. <laughs> <laughs> How was the uh, the trip to London? Oh, it was fantastic. Uh, Annette and I had a wonderful time. Saw a lot of the, the cool sights. And had a few beers at a few pubs. And I'm uh, sad to be back, unfortunately. Did you stock up on your Liverpool gear? I got myself a T-shirt and a little coffee thermal cup and a, a sign that the boys can uh, hang down in their uh, kind of big playroom area uh, in the basement. Very uh, cool. So, yeah, got a, got a few things. Very nice. Well, you come straight back into it and jump in a car and drive to Charleston because you are committed to the job, sir. Committed. Much appreciated. Well, thanks. <laughs> well, let's get into this one. Um, it, it's it's the Open Cup. We know it can get a little little weird with the rosters, and and when you look at Atlanta, there are some people who are going to be missing. But Frank DeBoer yesterday said that, and this is you know not new. He's, he said it before about he doesn't like to just go with wholesale roster rotation. What are you expecting out of the lineup tonight? Well, I tweeted out. Uh, you know, my best guess at a lineup based upon uh, the story that uh, one of our interns wrote from DeBoer's press conference on Monday. I was, I think, somewhere over Greenland at that point uh, (laughs) when Frank was talking yesterday. Um, I'm going to be surprised if you see guys like Lametti and Robinson in the lineup. Those guys need breaks. I know that if Atlanta United wins tonight, it's going to play again next week at some point. But it just seems like you need to save some minutes on these legs now. Um, and so I think you might see Parkhurst and Pogba. Escobar apparently is going to start. I'm curious about on the left if Ambrose is going to get a, a, a run and give Shea a rest. And then I'm really curious to see who the wide midfielders are going to be. I thought it might be Pereira and Miram uh, with Carlton in the middle, but it wouldn't surprise me, I guess, if Carlton is one of the wide midfielders and someone else is in the middle. And then, you know, you're, you're looking at guys coming off of injury, you know, like a, like a Mikey Ambrose, things like that. I guess what's the – from – what you've been able to to glean before you left and in the time that you've spent driving, I guess, what are the, the injury updates and possibilities for those guys to see any action tonight as well? Um, you know, I, if I were DeBoer, I would start Ambrose and I would start Kratz to give them some minutes um, and to save the legs of some other guys. But Frank has said that he's going to run out a lot of regulars. Sorry, there's a big V8 Titan going by me on my left if you hear a big truck sound. Um, so, yeah, maybe they'll be in the 18. I put them in my starting 11, but Frank and I and Tata and I typically didn't see eye-to-eye on rotating players in these types of games. I feel like Ambrose makes my opinion a lot of matters sense at all. <laughs> yeah. Well, you yeah. Know. It, uh, it, it, does, it does to me. It does to you. But, you know, Frank showed way back at the beginning of the season in that first game at D.C., he doesn't mind running the same players out time after time. So we'll see what happens. So let's let's flip it to what we know will not be there. We know that Joseph Martinez is with the Venezuelan national team through the end of their run in the Copa America. We know that George Bello is still out injured. We know that Julian Gressel is not making the trip. Uh, muscle tightness was the explanation from DeBoer. Um, who else? Am I? Uh, Tito Vialba, not there. He's in Argentina. He's been getting treatment on, on his injury. Ezekiel Barco uh, returning. What was the explanation on Leandro? Or was there one? I think just, just, just I, rest. I think just rest. Okay, because yeah. I, I knew Gressel I, it was specifically mentioned as muscle tightness, but... Yeah, I think he tightened up when he saw Joe Patrick's golf score. <laughs> well, I mean, wouldn't you? <laughs> nice. <laughs> uh, Joe could hit a golf ball now. Oh, uh, I have not seen this. Yeah, Joe shot like a 78. See, Joe's been sandbagging. Play. 
Wow. I, th- I think I think Julian tightened up a little bit when he saw Joe's uh, score on Twitter. Oh, okay. <laughs> okay. Well, uh, so we know a few guys aren't going to be there. I mean, I, I think – so we're down to, you know, options in the back. It, it seems like the center backs are going to be some combination of Robinson, Pogba, Parkhurst, maybe Lorenowitz. Uh, we know – Maybe – and you – you could play Escobar there, but I don't think that you would. could. You could. I don't know who would go on the right side if you did. That's probably the trickiest part. On the right. left, you've got Ambrose and Shea. And if, if Mikey's ready to go, I, I think maybe he's looked at a little differently since he, he had those big minutes in Monterey earlier this year. Maybe he's just in a different class, I guess, in the way the roster's looked at. You'd like to get him minutes tonight and see where he's at in his recovery. He seems further along than Kratz. We haven't seen as much of Kevin Kratz at the USL level. We've seen Mikey a few times now. Well, Kratz has been training for uh, with the first team for at least two weeks, I think. Oh, that's a little bit longer than I thought. Uh, okay. Yeah. So, you know, this would seem to be a good opportunity uh, yeah. for him to get some minutes before even maybe the twos. Uh, on what Saturday? Y'all, y'all said they play again on Saturday. Yep. Saturday at uh, Pittsburgh, right? Uh, it, seemed, it seemed to me to be a good opportunity to get him some minutes, but again, we'll see. Yeah how how important is the Open Cup to you? I mean, when you look at this team and and you look at specifically in 2019, because I feel like it, it's maybe a little bit different conversation than it's been in the past. How do you think the Open Cup is going to be in terms of importance for Atlanta United this year? Well, DeBoer said it's very important, um, and it is a trophy, so it does have some importance. Um, to me, I don't put a lot of value on it this season, only because the team has already played a lot of games because of the Champions League. It also has the Campionas Cup coming up this year. Um, I don't even, I guess if you win the U.S. Open Cup, you qualify again for the Champions League next year. Um so it does have importance in that regard. Yeah, it does but have that I, attached to it. I think I, I, this is going to sound weird. If Atlanta United wins tonight and if it wins next week, then I think suddenly it becomes massively important. These next two games, I think, have some importance, but not the utmost importance. No, that makes that total sense. sense. Yeah, that makes absolute yeah. sense. I'm, I'm with you on that. Go ahead, John. Since we're now in the international break, let me ask it this way, and you can go either A through F or grade it 1 to 100, however you want to grade it. What grade would you give Atlanta United right now here to the international break from match one to now? And you can grade it however you want, laugh or curve, whatever. But what grade would you give Atlanta United? From the Champions League or from league play? From Champions League, from absolute zero, match week, match one, to now, what what grade would you give the, the side this year? Oh, I'd probably give them a, a, a hard B right now. Um, you know, it probably started off, whatever, a, a low C. Uh, but I think they, Frank has, Frank DeBoer has, um, you know, found some things with the lineup. He's tried some things. He has not been stubborn or, or reticent to to make adjustments or to roll in players uh, to give them different starts and give other players a break. They're, what, second in the East in points per game? I think right now, trailing only Philadelphia, but they have games in hand. If they win those games in hand, they're back in number one in the East by a point, I believe. Um, that's not a spot that I think most people would have predicted after the first three games of league play, uh, you know, the start was rough. You, lo- you lose at Herediano. Not that they lost, but how they played wasn't great. Then the last 10 minutes at Monterey were just horrible. The whole game at D.C. was horrible. The effort against Cincinnati was horrible. Uh, they did defeat Monterey at Mercedes-Benz, but Monterey had a three-goal lead. So, you know, that is a gigantic factor in, in that result. Um but since then, you know, starting with the second half against Philadelphia, when Frank finally kind of scrapped the 3-4-3 and went with a, a formation that I think the players felt more familiar with, everything has been trending mostly up. 
the, the loss to Red Bulls was concerning, but they were just beyond tired in that game. So I'm not going to begrudge them too much for that. Uh, the next loss, same same issue, just beyond exhausted. And then they bounce back and, and get results in the next two games. So I think they entered the international break uh, probably at A- minus and overall uh, a grade of a B. All right, let's see what they get graded uh, for tonight in the Open Cup. Let's make some predictions. So this is a really hard one because I think Charleston has some, some questions about what their lineup's going to be like tonight too. The conditions are not going to be pleasant. Is it still a 100% chance of rain all night long? It's a 100% chance of rain until the evening, and then it drops down to a, a lovely 80% chance of rain. Ah, well, that's good. Uh, at the whatever the name of the stadium is now uh that is going to be torn down soon which is a a darn shame uh, um because it's a beautiful little stadium a lot of history inside the stadium particularly with all the cool soccer jerseys i was chris furmeister is riding with me to the game from pro soccer usa give him a shout out yeah what's Um, up chris shout out so chris and i and i'm assuming someone from the post and courier will literally be the only media in the stadium tonight now that the tv guys are for whatever stupid reason, are in Fort Lauderdale. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. So, anyway. It's a cool stadium. I hate that it's being torn down. It was the first soccer-specific stadium built uh, in, I think they say, the United States. Um, yeah, in the modern era, definitely. Um, yeah. It was just before the Columbus Stadium. Uh, it opened just before that. So, it's a shame that it's getting torn down. Yeah, I'm, and I'm curious I'm where the battery are going to play. Uh, also, very curious about that, and hopefully, we'll we'll be able to keep updating everybody on our our Charleston Battery Weekly show about what's next for the battery. Um, you know, does it involve potentially a move down to USL League One? I, they've done it before in the past with USL when USLs had two different levels of professional play. The Richmond Kickers, or longtime rivals, did that this year. It, it wouldn't shock me a bit. And then when you look at potential venues, I think the Citadel is probably the one that's been talked about the most, a little bit closer to downtown. So this does kind of feel like the end of an era in a lot of ways for the Battery, one of the the oldest, longest-running clubs in the United States and a a very proud club in this tournament. So no matter if it's a, a a game tonight where they do rotate the lineup a little bit, they're the last lower division team to make the final. In 2008, they got to the final against D.C. United at RFK Stadium. So I think they take it seriously even if they rotate. Conditions are a factor. Lineups are a factor. John, what's your prediction for tonight? Oh, let's see. With conditions being what they are anticipated to be, I'm going to say 2-0 Atlanta United. Okay. Is there a, a reason why? Do you want to give a little bit more than that? I, uh, you know, I think that Atlanta United defensively will be able to keep uh, eight foot three inch Ian Svantesen in check, and I'm just looking for it, it's, you know, honestly better talent pool, and uh, I think that talent wins out here. And I would have said three one if conditions were going to be better, but I'm going to stick with two nil with conditions being what they are. Okay, two nil Atlanta, regulation time. Doug, what do you think? Uh, first, John, tell your uh, friend from Philadelphia that they can easily make a song about being at the top of the table to Holland Oaks, You Make My Dream Come True. Because oh, I see, Holland Oaks, very nice. As we were driving down the road, uh, and Chris thought it was just a lovely rendition uh, <laughs> of, a, of a song. Well, and I'm kind of glad we missed hours, out on that so audio, Doug. I'm really going to entertain him the, whole, the rest of the drive. Um, <laughs> I think it's going to be one to nothing Atlanta United um, conditions are going to stink. I think it'll take a little bit for whatever changes Frank does put in the lineup to gel and Atlanta United just does not score a lot of goals. Uh, so one to nothing uh, for Atlanta United. And then we get to do this all over again, Memphis, Orlando, DC or Louisville. Uh, I think next week. Yeah, we'll, we'll see what happens with the draw once this round is completed. Um, could be any of those or maybe even something crazier. 
I think it's going to be a tough one because of the conditions as much as anything. Um, if I remember correctly, the surface at MUSC Health Stadium, even on good days, has had some issues on a day yes, where it's yes. going to rain all day and then continue raining into the night. I think it's going to create chaos in this match. I, I think it's going to be sloppy. I think goals are going to come from set pieces, not really from the run of play. And Atlanta United hasn't been great in set pieces scoring, although I think they can they can pull some things together here. I think Charleston with Svantesen gives them a, a weapon that's just a, a difficult person to deal with just because of his sheer height. I think it goes to uh, extra time. I think it's a 2-2 final, and it goes to penalties, and Atlanta advances. Wow. Uh, just conditions. I think it's just not going to be much of a soccer match. I think it's going to be absolute yeah. chaos. If the rain is what we're expecting, and, and that would be my caveat, if if it doesn't rain as much or it, it lightens up or the field holds up better than I'm expecting, then Atlanta wins the match. If it is a an, a match on a good field, Atlanta wins the match 2-1. But if it is ugly, and, and this is my official prediction, because I think it's going to be ugly, 2-2, two, two, Atlanta gets two on penalties. I have no faith in the groundskeepers at MUSC Health Stadium. Sorry, guys. I have no faith in the no, ground. I, I, I've been in that stadium the, each of the past two years when Atlanta United played its tournament here. And when it rains, that field, it does not drain uh, particularly well. So we'll see. Yeah, I just think it's going to be a weird night with all that that kind of weather. So buckle up, folks. Uh, Doug, what do you have coming up over at the HAC now that you're back on the beat? Well, in addition to entertaining Chris with my <laughs> lovely tunes. You might have to sing some on your Twitter. Chris is with Doug now. There you go. Uh, I'll have, uh, you know, game story, player ratings uh, from tonight. I don't know if I'll do a podcast unless Chris wants to join me. Uh, so Chris we'll can see. take my place. That would be completely well, he's, fine. Well, he's in the car with nobody. Can take Does he place, have any Jason. drinks? Well, I I know, and I appreciate that, Doug. Although I did, I brought a Kangol for Chris to put on, so uh, just to kind of recreate the podcast vibe. The, the Chris, uh, there you go. I cu- I couldn't fit the giant foam cowboy hat in the trunk. <laughs> I've never uh, seen this giant foam cowboy hat. I've been and waiting I have for not it. forgotten about that, Jason. I have not <laughs> forgotten about the giant foam cowboy. Hat. I've been waiting for it. Um, and then, you know, well, depending upon what happens in this game, I'll have some follows uh, over the next couple of days as I try to take a couple more days of vacation um, before if they play again next week. Yeah, and, and I think according to all of our predictions, they will be doing that somewhere, and we don't know where yet. Doug, thanks for the time. Thanks for uh, driving safely. Make sure you get be Chris safe. back home okay. Y'all be careful. All right, we'll see y'all. <laughs> see ya. We're going to take our final break, come back and wrap everything up with your final Tuesday thoughts on the Twitters right after this. A ranger station. I'd like to report a bear hug. Okay. I put out my campfire and Smokey Bear hugged me. So you drowned the fire, you stirred it, drowned it again, and felt that it was cold? Uh Uh-huh. Yeah, but he's just letting you know you did good. Bear hug from Smokey Bear. Status update. I'm going to let you go now. There are many ways to start a fire, but one sure way to put it out. Learn how you can do your part at SmokeyBear.com. Sponsored by the U.S. Forest Service Ad Council and your state forester. As a business owner, you know that every year brings new challenges and opportunities. The success of your business demands expertise and focus. And Country Financial can help you keep that focus by helping ensure you have the right insurance protection in place to meet your goals. Jason Wright can help you create a customized insurance plan that has coverages designed just for your business. Give Jason a call at 678-568-6871 or reach him on Facebook at Jason Wright Agency. Coverages vary by state. Policies issued by Country Mutual Insurance Company, Bloomington, Illinois. This is what matters. This is beyond X's and O's. This is the difference mutual respect makes. This is what character looks like. This is what defines us in Georgia. This is sportsmanship. School sports, it's not the outcome that matters most, but the way the games are played. This message presented by the Georgia High School Association and the Georgia Athletic Directors Association. If you've been hurt in a car wreck, contact my friend Steve Apolinski of Apolinski & Associates. 
He has been representing individuals for over 30 years throughout Georgia and Alabama. Email him at steve at aa-legal.com or call him 24-7 at 404-377-9191. The initial consultation is free. Final segment, Soccer Down here, June 11th. Tuesday thoughts. We have thoughts about the Netherlands with a late, oh. late goal oh. uh, substitute. Jill Roard from Bayern Munich with the goal. And in one of the most entertaining matches of the Women's World Cup so far, the Dutch get the 1 0 win over New Zealand. They are level with Canada at the top of Group E. <laughs> this is going to be a fun group, and that Netherlands Canada match. It's going to be a good oh. one. Um, the New Zealand Canada match is going to be a good one. I, I think New Zealand can get out of the group. They were really good today. They've got to continue yeah. to build from here. Uh, your twelve o'clock game is the other game in uh, the United States group. It's Chile and Sweden at noon. That's on FS1, and then USA Thailand at three o'clock on Big Fox. Um, it's also on the Fox Sports app. I had to go like. Round and round. I, I hadn't dealt with the Fox Sports Go and Sports apps, and I think they've changed everything over uh, the last few months because I was waiting on my car to get the oil changed yesterday. I set an appointment for 1230, and I left at 4 o'clock uh, because there was an oil change. I had to get the battery replaced, and I've learned now that, that batteries on Kia Souls are very tricky. You can't just go and, and replace it easily. Mechanics have to be involved. It's weird. I don't know. I've replaced batteries on yeah. so many cars. But Kias are, are funky, or at least the Soul is. So needed a new battery because it was affecting some stuff. Once that got in there, they were able to adjust the... There were some issues with the power steering, but it was all related to the battery. So it's all good. So it just took a while, but I'm sitting there trying to watch some of the Women's World Cup. So I download the Fox Sports Go app because I didn't have it on the new phone. Get get to that. Want to watch the game? That tells me I have to go download the Fox Sports app. So I get to that. Then I've got to get authenticated. It was like so many steps. I was finally able to watch the end of the Argentina match yesterday with Japan, and and watch a little bit of of Canada and Cameroon before I listen to the rest on on Sirius XM driving home. So it, you can watch all of these now that I know it's the Fox Sports app. You have to okay, get it. and you get that, and you can watch everything. So. Yeah, I just stream the cable. Well, that's not streaming cable. That's just watching it on cable TV. That That's just yes. turning on the TV and watching it on cable TV. Streaming uh, yeah. would be if you like couldn't watch, yeah, it, on watch it on cable TV phone. through the app. That's what I'm talking about. Yeah. Well, no, through the Xfinity app. Ah, so you're doing it through the Xfinity app. Okay. Yeah. Because when you when you're uh, when you have them as cable, you download their app and then you can stream your home uh, devices. So I could stream the the TV out of Office HD and watch stuff that's going on on FS1 or on Fox or whatever. You're you're, you're watching your cable on your phone is what you're doing. Yes, that's yeah, correct. It's not about the TV at, at the office. It's just you're watching your cable on your phone. Yes. Okay, so the Xfinity app can do that. I, I do not have yes. Xfinity. Um, I have Uverse, so I downloaded the Fox Sports app. So if you have Fox on your Xfinity cable, you can watch it there. You can watch it on Fox Sports. You can watch it on Big Boy Fox TV. You can watch it at many of the viewing parties all over the Southland if you want to watch. I know the American Outlaws and Atlanta United are watching at RERA this afternoon. So... That's okay. U.S. women tonight or this, this afternoon. I think yeah. I'm going to throw a prediction on it. I'll go 4-0. Um, yeah. Don't really care what the final result is. I just want to see the team look very organized, and I want to see Samantha Mew start. That's the, the thing I really want to see, and it's the thing that I don't think is going to happen. Just build, develop, be healthy, and – uh, I, I don't really necessarily care what the final score is. I think it'll be comfortable, but uh, yeah, not looking for 
massive goal difference of like 38 or something like that. All right, we got a few uh, bits of news and rumor, and we'll start with the Women's World Cup. Uh, German star Jennifer Marazan, I, I think their best player overall. She's going to miss time. Now, how much time is she going to miss? We don't really know yet. Uh, there were some reports early that she would miss the rest of the tournament with a broken toe that she suffered right. against China in the first match. There's also been other reports that she'll miss the rest of the group stage. Uh, Kate Margraff chimed in and said that, you know, it's it's possible to play with a broken toe. It's not pleasant. It is not fun. No. no. Uh, but she's done it. Abby Wambach's done it. It, it can be done. Um, it's just going to be pain tolerance. And and honestly, like, I think which toe it is and, and how, you know, much of an effect that could be will we'll play into yeah, it. But. All of the cutting and the, the shooting and all that stuff, yeah. Yeah, it's it's very tough because she is their best overall player, and and that will definitely hurt them. But when you look at the group stage for Germany, they got through China. Their biggest test will be Spain. That's that's remaining. Then they get South Africa, where you can definitely get by without Marzan. So they should be okay. It might throw them into a second place situation if Spain can beat Germany, and and Spain had some yeah, moments where they looked really good against South Africa. They had some moments where they didn't look good. So Spain Germany will now decide Group B, and Spain I think has a a wider opening now to win this one. Stuff from MLS. There are reports now that LAFC has officially sold Andre Horta. So they have a designated player slot open. There are reports emerging this morning. Are, are you trying to grill again? No, no, no. I'm about ready to hop into a meeting, so I will let you uh, wrap everything <laughs> here. Daniela De Rossi to LAFC. Interesting. So, yes. uh, uh, so you have my prediction, and I will catch up with you later. I will see you at Grindhouse Mucha Plata, y'all. <laughs> there you go. I didn't know what was going on there with John. Yeah, meeting. Uh, cool. See ya. Bye. Bye. Daniela De Rossi potentially to LAFC. Um, Andre Hortz is gone. They have a designated player slot. <sighs> that's that's bold. That is incredibly bold for LAFC. So we will uh, find out what kind of an effect that will have. I think Mark Anthony K has been excellent in that role. If De Rossi comes in, what does that do for the midfield? De Rossi's an amazing player. Is he going to be able to hold up with a different pace of play i think a different intensity of play the travel that we know about in mls that can be difficult what does he have left in the tank at 35 36 years old and does this affect a chemistry that's been really good we don't know yet we're gonna have to wait and see um another rumor a couple other rumors that have popped up there are rumors and i don't think they've gotten past this yet out of orlando and more specifically out of paraguay that Oswe Colman will be returning to Cerro Porteño and leaving Orlando. And we've seen some where it's been a loan and others where it has been a permanent move away from Orlando. For whatever reason, Colman has, has not stuck with Orlando. I don't know if it is an issue of work rate, effort. There's been some hinting at that. There was a lot of talk among the Orlando squad about players not working hard last season Felt like some of that might be directed at Coleman, and he didn't see the field very much. I think he's an incredibly talented player, and I'd love to know the whole story here as to what has happened with him in Orlando. But if if they've moved on, if he's not going to play, if he's going to be a reserve, if he's going to be a guy who is only starting in emergencies, you're paying him way too much to do that. If you have an opportunity to move on from him, you have to take it. I'm curious as to what he will say once he is away from the club if those things are the case. Because, I, I, you know, we talked about it with Miguel Almiron and others who have left MLS and said really good things about the league. Coleman, I don't think, is going to have very good things to say after the way this has played out. Be curious to see what he has to say to Paraguayan media. There's another rumor out of Cincinnati, and, and I haven't seen too much on, on details here. But Jimmy Marine, you'll remember Jimmy Marine from Aridiano. 
winger who came back from injury against Atlanta in the first leg in Costa Rica was electric in that match, struggled in the second second match at Kennesaw. Linking him, rumors linking him to Cincinnati. I think that's an outstanding move if Cincinnati can pull it off. And remember, Alan Cruz for Cincinnati came from Arediano, played with Jimmy Marine. So you have a bit of a connection there that would help Marine as he adjusts to, to Cincinnati and to MLS. If Cincinnati can pull that one off, it feels like a great move because it would be a manageable price and it's a young player who I feel like hasn't hit his ceiling yet. If Cincinnati can get Jimmy Marine, that would be a great one for them. All right, let's hit the rest of the Twitters. Um, Daniel Price says, apparently Grindhouse has the best burgers. I would agree with that. I don't think they won the uh, the HAC contest for best burgers, but they were in the finals. I I think they're great. So I'm looking forward to having a Grindhouse Burger tonight, watching Atlanta United in the rain in Charleston. I just hope the field holds up okay. I really hope it does. Um, Tafka says, I'd like to put the Atlanta United legal team on the all-star ballot. The fact that we have green carded so much of our club, given its composition, is insane. Romario Williams, Gordon Wilde, Julian Gressel, John Gallagher, Leandro Gonzalez Perez, Kevin Kratz, Joseph Martinez, Tito Vialba, Chris McCann, Kenwin Jones as well. That's crazy. Yes, it is. <laughs> that is uh, some really good work out of the legal team getting these green cards. Um, this is a big advantage. And, and now you're starting to get some conversations because of how easy it is to get green cards. You're starting to get some conversations as you go into a CBA process where players from outside the league outnumber domestic players for the first time. Now, U.S. law, like there's no way around that. You have, if a player has a green card, you have to treat them as a citizen for, for work purposes. So the league can't create, I think, a different type of quota or anything to avoid this. I, I don't, and, and Tafka and, and the, uh, soccer down here legal team might be able to chime in on that. I don't think there's any way they can do anything differently than they're doing now. So with the ability of some clubs, and it's some, it's not all, it's some clubs getting green cards easier than others, it does give a huge advantage in roster construction because you're able to go get more players from outside the United States and bring them in. With the CBA coming up, and Sam Stejkal wrote about this, you have a, a different dynamic than maybe you've ever had the union and the leadership of the union has generally been dominated by domestic players when stage call put this out there on twitter you saw a lot of players uh domestic players chime in and say that the the players union is united and the the international players the domestic players are all together on the same page in, in what they're wanting if they are, that will, will make it so much better for the players to get everything that they want in this negotiation. In the past, it has been alluded to that the players' union being a bit disjointed between domestic players and international players has hurt them in negotiations. So we're just going to have to wait and see. You know, the, the talk immediately after this hit was that, no, everything's good. We're all on the same page. You really don't know until you get into the, the heart of the negotiation. So this CBA for Major League Soccer, it is critical for what's coming up next. It's critical for some of the next steps for Major League Soccer as a whole. You have to keep the players happy. They, they've hinted at being willing to strike for the first time in league history. Hopefully it doesn't come to that because that would be, a, a think, a black eye for the league if it's any kind of protracted, protracted situation. But you have the CBA going into 2020. You're going to have a TV negotiation that I believe can start in 2021. If not, it can start in 2022. I believe the contract is up at the end of the 2022 season original talk around that was that they couldn't enter into negotiations until a year before the contract ended. So it might be the end of the 21 season is when you can start negotiating. Not sure of the legality there. Not sure of that time frame, but 2021 is when that's going to start to get hot and heavy. 
I do think that we have seen that star power is important. Star power can be defined a lot of different ways. Atlanta United has star power, not in a traditional way. Joseph Martinez is a superstar in the city of Atlanta. Tito Villalba, Miguel Almiron have been superstars in the city of Atlanta. Leandro Gonzalez Perez is becoming a superstar. Julian Gressel's becoming a superstar in the city of Atlanta. I mean, he has his own like lifestyle brand right now. You know, it's it's working. So he's becoming a star. That's worked really well here. Other cities, you might need a established superstar coming in to get attention. I think Miami's going to need that. Nashville, we'll have to wait and see. Miami, they're they're going to need that. And I think they're going to deliver on that. Los Angeles needed a Carlos Vela. Flat out. LA Galaxy, we know they're star chasing. We know what they do. Other cities have been able to create stars. But you need stars. If you create them or if you go buy them, you need stars. You need stars for the quality of the league to get better. You need stars, more importantly, for that TV contract. Because stars drive attention. The quality of play drives attention. You need stars going into that TV contract to get more money. And that's going to be, you know, we're talking potentially negotiation starting in two years. What's the landscape going to be on cable television in two years? What's the landscape going to be on how widespread streaming is? How accepted streaming is at that point? Is it going to be a situation where you have a national deal with ESPN, Fox, which I think are very important because you have to have that mainstream side. You have to have that that footprint. But are you going to see a new national game of the week on a Hulu or on a Netflix or on a YouTube TV or on a Flow FC or whatever it is that is going to be bought and paid for that the only way you can watch that game is to be part of that streaming network is that going to happen there's talk about that happening with the nfl with other sports mls seems to be in a position where they would take that chance maybe more than somebody else would do they become the guinea pig for it that next tv contract could look very different than what the current one does with national games and not necessarily a game of the week on a Fox network, on an ESPN network, and on a, an Univision network, but roughly a game of the week on each? Is it going to look different? What is the streaming component, the out-of-market side that is now on ESPN Plus? What is that going to look like? These things are all steps. So the owners and the players have to come together to create the plan for the next CBA. That's going to push MLS to where it is in terms of overall league development? Do you have more designated players? Do you have more allocation money to work with? Do you have other roster components that need to be addressed? Is there more money for homegrowns? All of that stuff will set the league up to then go hit the TV markets and say, here's where we're at. We're going to do this to put a better product on the field to get more of your money. Are you in? These next couple of of years in that regard are going to be massive for where Major League Soccer is going into a 2026 World Cup in the United States and Canada and Mexico that will change where soccer is in the overall conversation of sports on this continent, period. Mexico, not going to have a huge change. Canada will have a gigantic change. United States could absolutely change the landscape. If MLS does the right things, in the lead up to be in a position to take full advantage of it. The CBA is, is incredibly important. And on the player side of it, they have to be united to get the most out of it. The owners have to be willing to invest more. And that's not all just straight up large amounts of cash. They have to be more committed as Arthur blank told them at the all-star game last year. They have to be more committed across the board. This league has a ton of potential I think it is a top 10 league in the world right now. I think it's probably around seven or eight. I think after that 2026 World Cup, it can be in a much better position and it can pass a France. I really do think that's possible. But you have to do these things right to get there. If you don't, you're not going to be in that position. So that CBA is massive. The TV contract is even more important 
and just where this league is positioned in the global landscape is going to be a big part of it. And I know sometimes we we don't really dig too deep into that side of it of the the overall landscape around the world because we think about the landscape here in the US but both are very important I think for MLS going forward and that's the uniqueness of of soccer in this country and on this continent that's it for today we'll be back tomorrow nine o'clock it's a wall pass Wednesday we'll be taking your questions have a lot to talk about with the US again three o'clock on Fox against Thailand with Atlanta United 7.30 ESPN Plus against Charleston. No radio broadcast tonight. Six other games in the U.S. Open Cup tonight. Plenty to talk about there. Plenty to talk about from the rest of the Women's World Cup. Plenty to talk about with the Dutch and New Zealand. And we'll have a World Cup date after the U.S. game. It should be out by 6 o'clock tonight. So be on the lookout for that. Thanks, everybody, for listening. We really, really appreciate it. Thanks for all the interaction this morning. Mucha plata, y'all.